This video brought to you by Loot Crate. Go to trylootcrate.com slash halocanon and use promo code BRIDGE10 to save 10% on a new subscription. Stick around to the end for more details. Welcome back, Spartans. Just over two weeks ago, and almost under the nose, Halo Smoke and Shadow was released for ebook readers. Written by Kelly Gay, Smoke and Shadow follows Ryan Forge, daughter of Sergeant John Forge, and her quest to discover the fate of her father. Before diving in, I have to absolutely praise the author, Kelly Gay. Following the book's release, myself and others open dialogue with Miss Gay over certain aspects of the story, note, far from anything bad. Ms. Gay was very open, revealing that she not only was a longtime Halo fan, but that she was familiar with some fairly obscure lore. While Halo Smoke and Shadow is the first book to feature Lucy Orion, Ryan Forge, by name, she was first mentioned in auxiliary material, notably the Halo Wars Prima Game Guide. I mean, how many fans actually read the guides? And this author read that, and wanted to expand on it. That's fucking amazing, so major props to Ms. Gay. But, awesome as all that is, it has no bearing on the quality of the story itself. Spoilers ahead, as always. If you want to avoid spoilers, click the annotation on the screen or check the description box and skip forward to the spoiler-free wrap-up and rating. For everyone else, this is Halo, Smoke and Shadow. Our story, somewhat unfortunately, begins with Into the Fire, the short story from Halo Fractures. Into the Fire gives us the setup and introduces us to Ryan and her world. Set in January 2557, Ryan has grown up to be a smuggler working out of everyone's favorite colony, Venezia. After a recent job, she's informed by Norfell, made of Sobfell from the Kilo 5 trilogy, that a man named Roos knows of some major salvage. Ryan then meets with Roos, who tells her about what looks to be a downed UNSC ship on the colony of Aero in the Ectanus 45 system. To note, Aero is the satellite of Cairo, a planet that first appeared in Halo the Cold Protocol, though the planet remains uninhabited post-war. Anyway, Ryan takes the job and heads back to her ship, the Ace of Spades, to inform the crew. Her crew is comprised of Lessa and Nico, two orphans Ryan picked up from Alaria, the desert colony from Halo Nightfall, Kip Silas, and Cade. Lessa's the pilot, Nico's the computer guy, Kip's the engineer, and Cade, the ex-marine, is the additional muscle and, as we learn later on, on-off lover of Ryan. Though tired from their previous mission, they all agree to the new one, and the ace departs from Venezia. Pausing a moment, I have to point out the Firefly slash Serenity-like feel among the crew, something I won't be able to properly communicate through summary. The crew of the Ace of Spades is very much a family like the crew of the Firefly-class ship Serenity, Ryan a gender-bent Malcolm Reynolds in many ways. Funny enough, this was something of an accident. Ms. Gay noted that while the similarity was never intentional, she picked up on it after the first draft and just rolled with it. A while later, Ace arrives over Aero, and Lessa lands here near the ship they're there to salvage, a Halcyon-class light cruiser, the UNSC Roman Blue. Entering through a large plasma gash in the hull, Ryan and Kip head towards the bridge, K to the armory, Lessa to the medbay, and Nico to cryo. When Nico discovers intact cryopods, Ryan sends Kip to help him, while she heads into the captain's quarters looking for any intel on the ship. At best, she could inform any families of the fate of the ship, but secretly, Ryan hoped she'd find a clue to the fate of her father. And find a clue she does. If you've read Halo Escalation, seen my reviews, or seen my review of Halo Fractures, or all of those, you'll know the connection the Roman Blue has to the Spirit of Fire. During the first invasion of Arcadia, when the Spirit was chasing after the ship that held Dr. Ellen Anders, Captain Cutter dropped a log buoy to let the UNSC at large know where they were headed. The Roman Blue, captained by then-Captain Terence Hood, was supposed to retrieve the buoy, but instead engaged the remaining Covenant. The Covenant destroyer, Radiant Perception, was more than a match for Roman Blue, forcing her to retreat. The log buoy thus was never found. Inside the remains of the Halcyon, Ryan finds the logs of Captain William Webb, who was given command of Roman Blue after Hood's blunder. The logs detail the incident and give Ryan hope, for the first time, that she might find her father. Her momentary victory is cut short, however, when the Roman Blue is fired upon. Ryan orders her crew back to the Ace, telling them to take off once they're all on board, leaving her if necessary. The crew begrudgingly obeys, returning for Ryan once the attacking ship, whatever it was, is gone. Back on board, Ryan takes a brief shower before revealing what she discovered, also revealing her connection to the Spirit of Fire, to her crew. Through the novel, we get snippets of Ryan's past. Earlier, when she was receiving the intel on what would turn out to be the Roman Blue, we got a flashback to a moment when her aunt, a woman named Jillian, 
was harassed by a Marine lieutenant, and then saved by her father. Fun fact, this moment was originally told in the Halo Wars game guide, Ms. Gay adding further detail and the presence of Aunt Jillian. During her shower, Ryan thinks back to how she became a salvager. When Ryan was a teenager after her grandfather had died, she tried to enlist in the Marines as a way to connect and possibly find her father, but she could never get herself into the recruiter's office. Instead, she found herself in the company of the Burger Salvage Crew. She started on the path of a salvager and never looked back. Of interest is the fact that Ryan's grandfather died of Boren Syndrome. The disease is often said to be fake, it's listed as such on both Halo wikis. But one thing we know for sure is that it was used to cover up the side effects of the augmentations given to the Orion candidates, aka the Spartan Ones. So, could John Forge's father, Ryan's grandfather, have been a Spartan One? To quote Ms. Gay, it's definitely a logical assumption considering his background, but yeah, can't confirm or deny. Not a definitive answer, but certainly hinting towards a yes. I imagine it's up to 343 to decide one way or another. Anyway, once done with her shower, Ryan meets with her crew to tell them of her plan to chase the spirit, and that she doesn't expect them to tag along. However, she notes that the potential payout is massive. Naturally, everyone's on board, though not necessarily just because of the payout. Like I said, the crew is very much a family. Ryan's first move is to track down Radiant Perception, which might have recovered the log buoy. Ryan eventually does with the help of Norfell, even managing to get the information for free by accusing Nor of bad intel given the attack on the Roman Blue. As it turns out, the Covenant Destroyer had crashed on Laconia in February of 2531. Interestingly, Laconia is in the Procyon system same as Arcadia, and the estimated crash isn't far from where the Destroyer was engaged by Roman Blue. Seems Hood successfully, or somewhat aided, in the takedown of the ship. The destroyer's location was well known, but had been avoided for years because of a let Golo infestation. I think we all remember what that can look like. Before parting ways, Nor also informs Ryan that another salvage group, led by one Ram Chalva, had disappeared. She further warns of another upcoming salvage crew, Sanghili, led by Gek Lar, claiming to be working under Jewel Emdama. We jump forward as the Ace arrives in the Procyon system and heads for Laconia. When they arrive, they find that a group of Songheili, likely Gek's crew, had already landed, the teams inside the downed destroyer. Luckily, they were nowhere near the bridge where, or near where, the buoy was suspected to be. The Ace lands, and Ryan and Cade alone enter the Radiant Perception. They journey to the bridge where they find a lone Megalagolo, no shield or cannon, its Bond brother long dead. Using a device designed by Nico to locate the buoy, Ryan leaves Cade to monitor the Hunter. The device works, eventually leading Ryan straight to the buoy. When she begins to head back, however, she finds herself cut off by the Hunter. This is definitely one of the most interesting parts of the story. As she encounters this lone Mega Legolo, she suddenly feels a strange sensation, a vibratory groan as the book describes. Then the Hunter speaks one word. End. Some of the more lore-savvy may recall that hunters speak by vibrating their bodies, which, while allowing them to mimic traditional speech, also means that their words are, quite literally, felt. This is what Ryan now feels, and thanks to some excellent writing by Kelly Gay, this is what I felt when reading this. The hunter again says end. Ryan is paralyzed, unsure how to react, when Cade shows up and unloads into the hunter. As he does, Ryan can feel the creature's pain and relief. The hunter had wanted to die, to join its Bond brother. Kate and Ryan reunite, but Kate is upset that he allowed the hunter to get past him and that he choked, especially as a former soldier. Ryan tries to reassure him, but ends up saying something she immediately regrets. The two begin to head back to Ace in silence. Luckily, they make up once on board. As they prepare to take off, they spot Ram Chalva and the Sunkelian Storm Armor, but no helmet, taking pot shots at him. The crew doesn't know it yet, but I'm sure you've guessed. That Sanghili is Gek. Ryan brings Ace about, scooping up Rom before breaking Atmo. Earlier in the book, as Ryan and the crew were looking into Radiant Perception, we had a brief section with an unknown Oni agent, a mole in Ryan's crew, sending a message to their mission handler. Now, after recovering Rom, we find another message, this time revealing who the mole was. Kip Silas, or as he was known back on Cedra, Silas Kipley. If that name sounds unfamiliar, Silas Kipley appeared in one of the second story shorts that accompanied Halo Nightfall. Specifically, an Oni Eyes file titled Cooperative Protocol. This was definitely one of the coolest connections Ms. Gay made, and while I'm personally sad I didn't pick up on it myself, major props to those, like the Eld, who did. As the book goes on, we get into Silas's past, and how he went from Cedron Engineer to Oni Agent. As it turns out, Silas lost people during the attack on Cedra. His sister, 
brother, nieces and nephews, and his six-month pregnant love, Talia. He had managed to put it out of his mind, focusing on helping with the investigation and his work, for a while anyway. He began drinking and stopped going out, until Agent Han showed up at his door. Han managed to convince Silas to join Oni, to put his talents to work to do some good, perhaps even prevent another Cedra. Once Silas agreed to join, he was given the new name Kip Silas, along with a new identity. Now he had been placed on the Ace of Spades, sending communiques to Oni regarding Ryan's activity. Meanwhile, Nico had been trying to hack the log buoy and is finally successful. Inside, they find a message from the AI Serena and coordinates. Four days later, the Ace arrives in uncharted space, what we know to be the system that the Spirit of Fire found in Halo Wars. Of course, where the Spirit found a shield world, Ace finds only debris. Rock, metal, the remains of a ship of unknown classification, and an area protected by a shield. An area with atmosphere. Inside, they're able to detect faint signs of life and soon land. Kate and Ryan head out following what looks to be a stone path, eventually leading to a Forerunner site. Inside, they find a council, which Ryan mysteriously finds herself drawn to, though Kate stops her before she touches it. This was a nice, subtle reference to the gay eye which the librarian had implanted in most humans, which in turn is what identifies the species as reclaimers and allows us to activate Forerunner tech. This would also seem to be a callback to Halo the Flood, wherein the Chief, upon seeing a Forerunner panel to activate a light bridge, notes that it feels familiar. Anyway, Ryan and Kate get a sudden call from Ace, which has detected another ship the war freighter from Laconia, Gek Lar's ship. As it turned out, Gek had tagged Rom, tracking them to the unknown system. Ryan and Cade make a break for the entrance, but Ryan is suddenly grabbed from behind and tossed back into the room by none other than Gek himself. As Gek was preparing to engage, a voice rang out from the council, a forerunner Ancilla. As Ryan had tried to stand, she'd accidentally touched the council, alerting the Ancilla to her presence. Gek had already been enraged at Ryan's mere presence in this place, and this only angered him further. Two more Sangheili show up, but Gek tells them to leave Ryan to him. They head towards the entrance right to where Cade is. Luckily, he had been prepared with a thermite device. Cade then heads in to help Ryan with Gek, but is caught off guard by Gek's energy sword. Ryan, in a fury, jumps on Gek, hoping to shoot him right in the head. His movement throws her off, however, and she only manages to graze his eye. Bleeding, Gek tosses Ryan off of him. She then grabs a frag grenade, intending to blow herself, Cade, and Gek to hell. Gek, not wanting to risk harm to the luminary he'd brought with him, gathers up Cade's dog tags for his collection and leaves. Ryan drags herself over to Cade, exchanging some last words just before he passes away. Sometime later, her crew shows up to recover them both. As they prepare to leave, the Ancilla from before speaks up, asking to be taken with them. When Ryan asks it about itself, this Ancilla reveals that it had once been the AI that monitored Shield 0459. When the Spirit of Fire had destroyed that installation, the AI had created numerous copies and fragments in an attempt to preserve itself. In the end, only this fragment survived, this one little bit. After hearing that it had indeed been the Spirit of Fire that had destroyed the Ancilla's installation, Ryan agrees to take Little Bit, as the Ancilla would come to be called, with her. The book comes to a close as Ace returns to Venezia. With Little Bit's help, Ace was able to return in just an hour. Now, I'll be honest, I was a little off-put by this development. One of the criticisms leveled at the Kilo 5 books was the seemingly magical ability of the Huragok to make massive improvements to UNSC technology. While a Huragok making such improvements does at least make some kind of sense, an AI being able to just doesn't make any to me. The Huragok were making modifications to the hardware, the way things worked. An AI at best could rewrite some software. I will say, in defense of this novella, in Halo First Strike, Cortana was able to improve the capability of a Covenant Carrier's plasma weaponry when in the ship's systems. However, that seems like small beans compared to improving a ship's slipspace drive-by. I don't know how to calculate that percentage, but by a lot, I'll say. Anyway, once on Venezia, Rama is moved to a proper hospital to treat his wounds, and Ryan has a talk with Little Bit. It once again relates the tale of its shield world as best it can given its broken state, and shows some of the limited images it had one that included her father. It reveals that it also has the spirit's initial trajectory after slingshotting out of the shield world. When Ryan inquires about casualties, it reveals it doesn't know. The novella comes to an end as Ryan resolves to find her father and Cade's killer. And that is Halo Smoke and Shadow. For a novella, the story contains a lot of references and connections to a lot of rather obscure media and sources alongside the larger stories and games. 
The idea of following Sergeant Forge's daughter is absolutely brilliant, and while we may know the fates of certain characters that are either mentioned or appear, the journey of Ryan is absolutely worth it. Sadly, there are some negatives I must address. The biggest one is that this should have absolutely been included in Halo Fractures. It's a short story like Saint's Testimony or Shadow of Intent, the first 18% into the fire is already in there, and it came out only two months after Fractures. There is literally no reason this story couldn't have been included in Halo Fractures. Second is that this really should have been a full novel. The book doesn't exactly end on a cliffhanger, far from it, but it's clear that the journey is not over. While I can't wait to see the rest of that journey, 343 really should have commissioned a full novel if they were going to release Smoke and Shadow outside of Fractures. Still, with those criticisms aside, the novel was an overall blast. With careful consideration, I'm giving it a 9.5 out of 10. It's damn close to a perfect 10, but some small narrative issues which are spoiler related and 343's odd publication choice hold it back just a bit. Still, get the book when you get the chance. It's worth it, especially for $2 USD. Well, that brings this review to an end. I hope it was worth the wait, and I'm sorry that there was a longer wait than necessary. Thanks for watching as always, and until next time, this has been Halo Cannon. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to give a like and consider subscribing and sharing this video around. Also consider subscribing to Loot Crate. By going to trylootcrate.com slash halocannon and using promo code BRIDGE10, you can save 10% on a new subscription to the base Loot Crate offering. Loot Crate is a monthly subscription box service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear.